Welcome to the afternoon session for the metal finishing um, group and the continuing education conference this fall. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview, sort of run through of the program that we have for you this afternoon, and then I will give you more in-depth um, uh, introductions to each of our three speakers as we move through the presentations. Um, but the first, the overview is that we'll have three speakers. Um, first will be Miguel Rodas uh, uh, with an overview of chemical use and pollution prevention opportunities in metal finishing from California, specifically the LA Sanitation District and working with their significant industrial users to implement pollution prevention projects. Then we will move on to Dave Fister, who has recently retired from New York State P2I as an engineer working with industries to implement TUR projects. And he will give specific uh, case study examples from the metal finishing sector um, that he worked with in New York State. And then we will have Greg Morose, who's the research program director with Turi, and he will speak about ongoing hex chrome conversion coding alternative research for the aerospace and defense sector. Uh, and then we hope to have time at the end for a bit of a panel discussion Q&A um, from all of our speakers. So I will um, go ahead and give a longer introduction for Miguel as he gets his slide presentation up. He has been with the city of Los Angeles' source reduction program for 18 years. He performs inspections and sampling, sampling of facilities subject to federal regulations as part of his duties as an inspector. Miguel is part of the P2 Green Chemistry team at LA Sanitation and Environment, in which along with other team members, he coordinated the pilot project with metal finishers to collect data for the creation of a P2 GC, a green chemistry checklist. Um, so Miguel, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, let me see, I think I jump into number two. Now this is, uh, Slide number one. Can you see my my screen? It's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, my name is Miguel, and I work for City of Los Angeles with the LA Sanitation and Environment. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute for this opportunity. To my manager's uh, division in industrial waste management division and also to Jennifer Kong, who is the program manager of LA Industry. As the LA Industry program, I participate as the champion for the metal finishing uh, group. My job or my extra work beside my regular job is to reach out to metal finishers and uh, promote pollution prevention. And in this case, promoting uh, green chemistry. And this is exactly a part of uh, this presentation. I, I, don't, I don't claim to be an instructor, a professor or a teacher or uh, something like that. I'm just a, uh, a environmental compliance inspector with, with more than 18 years doing uh, inspecting facilities uh, subject to the city local ordinance and also subject to federal regulations. Uh, we had at one point, and we still have a, a good a good number of facilities in the city of Los Angeles that are subject to different federal categoricals. Uh, that, that's who I am. And part of what I'm doing with you today is sharing what we are doing uh, regarding green chemistry. I know it's a challenge, especially in metal finishing. Some of you are already familiar with metal finishing, but just to give a uh, context to this presentation, uh, the surface finishing industry play a, an important role in many other industrial sectors by providing a, an important uh, service, which is corrosion protection, especially. A, and many other uh, industrial sectors are, are served by, by the metal finishing and among those uh, industrial sectors are aerospace, uh, military, defense, uh, car manufacturers, electronic sector, the medical sector, and construction building sector also, just to name a few. So basically uh, corrosion uh, uh, has a great impact in, in, in metal structures uh, cor through corrosion. So once a... Uh, 
machinery gets exposed to to the elements it will it will break down at, at some point and it will lose its its strength uh, pipes we probably you heard about stories in the city of los angeles of, of, of pipes breaking and because of this problem corrosion and uh, and also the cars, uh, uh, many industrial users in, in California serves the, the, uh, the car restoration uh, type of uh, niche industry. Uh, we have many, many, many old antique cars that can be restored back to life by, by metal finishing. Uh, and even bridges, they collapse thanks to the new um, infrastructure uh, build better uh, back i guess it is i'm not <laughs> promoting any politics here but that's exactly part of what hopefully we're going to see with metal finishing uh, things uh, get get better for metal metal finishers after this pandemic and and so this is some of the items that um, metal finishers uh, bring back to life this industry uh, in reality faces various challenges at the regulatory level. Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, because they, they generate significant amount of, of, of hazardous waste. And so uh, it is a, a, an intense chemical environment because of the heavy use of inorganic acids, organic solvents, uh, high pH detergents, and so on and so on. So it, it is it is a, a challenge for metal finishers to remain sustainable. And so that is why it is important to implement source reduction, pollution prevention. Um, many of the industrial users that I have been talking with in the city of Los Angeles, they have reported to me that the, the, they are operating right now at a profit margin of less than 10%. So, uh, but that has to do with, with not implementing pollution prevention practices as I will show later on. So here, uh, basically metal finishing is the, um, intersection of two uh, very important scientific fields, which is physics and, and chemistry. And uh, by the way, one of the subject matter that I had problem during college was, was physical chemistry, uh, specifically electrochemistry, which deals with electroplating. So it, it is a great challenge. And one interesting thing about some of industrial users uh, operating these facilities is that they have no uh, chemistry background whatsoever. So finding the pollutant within within the rinses is, is, is a mystery for some of them. And we have been able to fill that gap, that information by bringing that information to them. Uh, so basically, uh, the metal finishing operation can be divided in three major uh, steps. First is the surface preparation. It is an essential part of the initial stage of the actual finishing process. There is a saying within this, this uh, a, uh, owners and operators of this facility that you cannot make an excellent coating with a poor surface preparation. So surface preparation is a very important step before the actual finishing is done. Because in, if the surface is not prepared properly, then uh, the uh, face reject parts and that is already represent a, a, a loss. So there are two types of uh, surface preparation, physical and chemical. Physical by using different means of uh, a, to remove a scale and oxides by buffing, grinding, and polishers. And also the other type of surface preparation is uh, chemical by using uh, cleaning of parts by, by using, for example, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, uh, high pH detergents and so on and so on. 
And then the next step is the actual finishing. According to the federal uh, government, there are six core operations that are subject to the federal regulation. And they are the um, electroless plating, electroplating, chemical etching and milling, uh, coating, uh, the manufacturing of printed circuit boards. And uh, I think I'm forgetting another one is the um, anodizing. And the last step on, on this uh, process of metal finishing is the post finishing of the parts, which serves to seal the, the actual finishing to, to extend more the, the corrosion protection. There are opportunities at each step, pollution prevention opportunities at, at, at each step. And we're gonna cover uh, this a little bit uh, during uh, this presentation. And, and so here we are um, specifically on, on the green chemistry part. Uh, I will try to bring up what we are doing or how we try to find green chemistry in, in metal finishing operations. The, the compartments of the checklist, uh, we're offering you today a um, checklist for you to review and to provide comments. Uh, we have developed this checklist to make assessments of metal finishers and see how they are doing in, in terms of pollution prevention and how we are trying to promote or mainstream the green chemistry. We will also look at the intersections between these compartments of where we find those pollution preventions that are deemed green. And then lastly, the benefits of pollution prevention. Before we, we go on with, with this, uh, with the checklist also, uh, it's very important how or which strategy we have been following on, on, on doing this, this strategy. So the first uh, step that we have taken is, uh, or uh, let me go back over here. I was giving a, a task to create the checklist and then, uh, in try to incorporate green chemistry into the metal finishing. So by reading some of the technical papers out there, I, I, I find that the, the uh, dif uh, different definitions of, of green chemistry, and one of them is given by the EPA. And the definition given by EPA is the design. And I make an emphasis on design because chemists are the one in charge of designing the chemical, the next generation of chemical products and processes that will reduce or eliminate the use of hazardous substances through their life cycles, including again design and the manufacturing use and end of life of those of those chemicals. So in reality, green chemistry belongs to 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 the chemistry to to the chemists in the lab by by uh, designing and creating new uh, chemicals that are that will be green, and and to reduce uh, the hazardousness of many existing chemicals, especially in metal finishing operation, they are heavy users of very toxic, flammable, corrosive, reactive uh, uh, chemicals in this industry. And so far, since the uh, incorporation of green chemistry, uh, this uh, or the, the landscape of chemicals available for metal finishers is still about the same thing. And, and, and by the way, chemistry is, is chemistry. Only now the green part is guided by the 12 principles, which were uh, devised by the, uh, who is considered the father of green chemistry is Paul Anastas. Now, the next definition of green chemistry is the given by the uh, Green Chemistry and Commerce Council. 
And, and this one, uh, I found this definition or extended definition more usable in, in promoting or mainst mainstreaming the green chemistry in metal finishing. So according to the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, green chemistry is the incorporation of every element of a business from feedstock selection through operations and finished products, and even including the way companies manage their, their business and how they engage their customers through the supply chain. So among the strategies that we're taking and the checklist is based on this uh, definition is we are approaching on how we can find the new raw materials, new, new material substitution, new process substitutions and metal finishing, and also changing the practices on how they operate their facilities and also the reduction of chemicals of concern. This is uh, the strategy that we are taking and how we are planning to create and grant a green certification to metal finishers and other industrial users among other uh, industrial sectors. So here we are. The, the, the idea is that at every, the checklist uh, a, the, or the structure of the checklist is, is three compartments, which is water conservation, the Next compartment is the reduction or elimination of chemicals of emerging concern. And also the next compartment is pollution prevention practices that belong to the maintenance, the operations and maintenance. So where do we find those pollution prevention practices that belong to or are deemed green is in between this small subsections of pollution prevention practices among these, these compartments and green chemistry. Uh, like I said before, I will give uh, some examples of, of what are we looking right now as green based on different sources. And uh, so far, water conservation, for example, I'm not going to uh, focus on water conservation. I think somebody else did that already, but there are many pollution prevention practices within this compartment that have a great impact on, on the operations in metal finishing because they reduce water consumption and they reduce wastewater generation. And let's move on over here to... Uh, so that's, that's again the, the great idea. So nor within the universe of pollution prevention practices, not all are or belong to the green chemistry. So green chemistry, however, is pollution prevention at the molecular level. So we're still waiting for those chemicals that are green at the molecular level. And so here we are with uh, the uh, process substitution and product change. So when a facility make uh, changes in one or more process or parameters or equipment used in, the, in that process or in that operation, they, they are already reducing the amount of waste generated. With the um, material substitution, the change or replace of existing raw materials within already that, let's say, electroplating tank used in that process with other materials that produce less waste or non-toxic waste in any medium, water, air, or land, they are already engaged in, in, in promoting green chemistry. And lastly, uh, the reduction of or elimination of chemicals of emerging concern. The Department of Toxic Substances Control in California is already looking at products intended for, for, for children. So here uh, we will examine whether the products contain any of the listed chemicals of concern, and if so, whether a safer alternative chemical exists. Some of the uh, examples in process substitution 
or reformulation is, I, I wish I had time to cover all, all, all these, but I will, I will cover just a few of them. And one of them is the trivalent chemistries. So um, already in California, uh, uh, the California Air Resources Board is already making waves across the nation because they want to deface some facilities engaged in, in electroplating of, of uh, using hex chrome and or uh, anodizing using chromic acid or even uh, decorative uh, hex chrome. So even they are already offering incentives to make that transition. At the EPA level, uh, the trivalent chemistry have been already approved as a green process. So he, here, this is the classic example of what a green process qualify or I would say promote green chemistry. Drag out reduction is a very simple way of reducing or losing precious electroplating bath into the rinses. I have seen many facilities not having a, dra a drag out reduction or not addressing this because this is dollars going down the drain. So drag out reduction, it doesn't involve a, a, a big investment. It's just a couple of tanks and the layout of and the configuration of how parts are arranged. Circonization. This is fairly new and in a, it applies mostly on powder coating uh, operations. Uh, this one especially is a uh, surface preparation. Instead of using uh, chemicals based on phosphoric acid, uh, the circonization offer the green alternative. And then waste stream segregation by segregating, for example, non-cyanide with cyanide or non-chrome with chrome and treat, treating that waste stream more efficiently to meet the, the local or federal regulations of a, a, depending on what type of permit they have. And here we have also um, material or chemical substitution. Alkaline degreasing is, is, is a big uh, pollution prevention of very significant uh, pollution prevention practices uh, that that uh, a, is an alternative for using organic solvents and also the non cyanide chemistries and the ultrasonic cleaning in the jewelry uh, sector we have in city of los angeles downtown la a jewelry district and many jewelers have stopped using uh, cyanide for brightening of, of gold pieces. And instead now they're using ultrasonic cleaning. So that's, that's the green alternative for, for the cyanide based chemicals. And then lastly over here is the elimination and reduction of chemicals of concern. Hex chrome again, uh, tin plating, many printed circuit boards, in a um, city of LA are moving or eliminating lead and making the, tra the transition to tin only in their printer circuit board manufacturing. This um, move away from lead, uh, it is tied with the European legislation, what is called ROHAS or restrictions of hazardous substances, which impact the entire electronic industry and many electrical products as well. So print, print the circuit board is a component of a, an electronic device. And what the European legislation is, is uh, focusing is in the eliminating or already looking at that these electronic devices end up at the landfill. And, and so they do not contain, uh, for example, cadmium, mercury, chromium, and um, lately some talates, some, uh, and now I think soon they're going to van uh, PFAS. That is the, the, the new uh, uh, regarding EPA on moving on, on regulating uh, metal finishers. And here, um, 
what I'm presenting to you is part of my job on creating the, the checklist was to make an assessment of our inventory. We have about 90 facilities. We used to have more. Many metal finishers have disappeared for different reasons. But what we have left is 89. We have some existing facilities that are subject to 40 CFR 413. We have other facilities that are called new sources, subject to 40 CFR 433. And here is what I found on metal substitution. 36 facilities are implementing of HEP jump to use water-based uh, alkaline degreasing. So they are no longer using uh, organic solvents, but now they're using alkaline degreasing. MS-10, we find three facilities only uh, using water-based solvents. And MS-50, it's uh, four facilities non using non cyanide chemistries and and the code is is uh, we, this is the codes we use for pollution prevention in the city of los angeles it's just uh, i wanted to mention that that uh, across uh, other uh, states they they might use something else but this is exactly how the code we we use in the city of los angeles and lastly ms80 the travailent chemistry we have not too many facilities jumping again on trivalent chemistry. First, because it is expensive. I have one facility already, one of these three that have jumped to trivalent chemistries and they have spent more than $150,000 on, on, on that transition. And the next data that I collected is the process substitution and product change. Most of the facilities are doing drag out. I would say not most, but only 15 are doing drag out reduction. And like I said, this is very simple, a pollution prevention technique. However, not every metal finisher out there is taking advantage on preventing that type of loss by implementing drag out reduction. And then sandblasting, which is a physical means on surface preparation. On PC or uh, product change, the two over here is belong to two facilities that are jumping or moving away from the lead plating and moving into tin uh, only plating. And then cooling towers. Some facilities use cooling towers for, for different purposes. And uh, some some of the blowdown from cooling towers may end up at the end of the of the of the the bulk volume of, of waste stream to be treated. So it is very important to remove chrome-based chemicals in using cooling towers to prevent corrosion in cooling towers. This is this is what I found. I'm not covering the data on water conservation because, like I said, somebody else already did that. Now, lastly over here, what are we, um, how can we look at the benefits of, of pollution prevention? Economically speaking, uh, it, it is cost-effective pollution prevention. It reduces uh, raw material loss by implementing drag out and also the financial impacts on rejects of reward part by, by uh, bringing in some filtration and some other recovery uh, technology such as ion exchange, reverse osmosis, and all that. Uh, and also uh, using or decreasing the amount of water usage, energy conservation, and also the saving on chemicals. At the regulatory level, pollution prevention practices uh, give the benefits of just not addressing end of pipe treatment, but also bringing the recovery and, and uh, reusing of that rinses to uh, reduce the water use again. Waste generation will be less and disposal costs also will be less. And then the liability aspect. Many of the metal finishers, uh, because of the chemical intense environment they work with, many of them receive workers' compensation because they do not implement very 
simple housekeeping. They don't, they don't address housekeeping issues. They don't train their personnel. And so they face health and safety issues that at the end of the day, they are very costly and bring a great impact on their sustainability. Um, this is my last um, screen. Uh, I have put some, some links over here on some of the materials where, where what I just said can be found in these uh, links over here. And now I turn to, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it to Pamela or uh, Joy, I'll, I'll I take guess. It, Miguel. Yeah, thank you very much. And I see a few questions popping up in the chat box. So feel free to continue to post those. We'll go back at the end and make sure those are covered in the time we have left at the end. Um, so, but for now we're gonna continue with our presentation. So Dave's gonna start sharing his slides and I will give a more in-depth introduction to him. Uh, Dave was a senior pollution prevention engineer at the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute at the Rochester Institute of Technology for 11 years before retiring in 2020. His work focused on parts cleaning in manufacturing, methods of improving water use, hazardous waste reduction and energy recovery and optimization. And you can find more full bios for all of our presenters on the conference uh, website of uh, posted materials. So with that, Dave, you wanna go ahead? Well, uh, hi all. Yeah, um, my time at Kodak, I was uh, indirectly involved with plating. At, when I worked at the Bausch & Lomb sunglasses division. I spent a lot of time working in the plating area um, and then just working uh, with uh, RIT for the last 11 years. Uh, with P2I, I did a lot of plating associated projects with uh, companies around New York State. So I'm going to be focused on that first section that Miguel mentioned, which is the whole uh, alkaline cleaning, going to acid etching, going to plating, painting, you name it, at the far end of uh, the cleaning operation. Dave, could you please share your screen? Oh, did I not share it? He did not share it. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I am not. That's weird. Why is it not even giving me the option of sharing a screen? There we go. Okay, let's try this now. Oop. My apologies, guys. It's okay. It's a nice picture of your family, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey. I had it open and everything, and it worked last time. So now what's going on? And I don't see. Oh. Am I screen sharing now? You are sharing your screen. If you go to the top left, you see a picture of a, of a uh, slideshow or, or a little icon that shows an image of a screen. Or right, right. there. Yeah, click there. Perfect. There okay, you go. So, all right. Big apologies. All right. So let's try this again. So um, your typical metal finishing line is alkaline cleaning, going to acid etch, and then going to your plating, painting, et cetera, eco, you name it. Uh, my outline, I'm actually going backwards. I'm gonna look at the acid bath life extension first, and then caustic cleaning life extension second, mainly because the acid bath life extension has a lot more details to it. So the whole idea is, again, if you're talking about pollution prevention, pollution production, uh, hazardous waste uh, treatment, all those things that are involved with the acid portion of a cleaning line. Uh, the whole idea is you're trying to increase the usable life of the acid bath, which also means you're reducing the amount of, oops, sorry, the amount of acid consumed. So that means you could reduce your acid purchases 
So reduced costs there, acid waste um, being generated, which means now you have less to treat, uh, less risk of injury from handling acid and acid waste, which results in cost savings, which is bullet four. And then finally, uh, if you can keep your acid tank more consistent, uh, that means your process is more consistent. So your etch rate in your acid tank will also be more under control. So what happens? Why do you lose acid? I mean, the first thing, the most obvious thing is your acid is consumed as it dissolves metal in the etching process. And then acid is also consumed when alkali from your uh, alkaline cleaning tank get dragged into the uh, from the rinses into the acid tank. The acid drag out, which Miguel also mentioned, drag out's a big problem if you're if you have parts that hold a lot of liquid. So acid just being dragged into the acid rinse tanks. And then the final bullet is uh, if your ac active acid goes down, which it will and your dissolved metals and salts go up as the bath is used, you get a slower etch rate, which means now you have not got the control you thought you might have as you were going through that cleaning process. So these are all commercially available technologies. I'm guessing there's probably more, but these are the ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, so acid absorption, which is basically ion exchange, uh, diffusion dialysis, which is uh, membrane osmosis, and I'll clarify the other types of membranes. Uh, electrodialysis, which is now a membrane plus electrodes. Uh, this is a fairly new one, uh, acid resistance nanofilter membranes. So pressurized membranes versus membrane osmosis. Uh, membrane osmosis says the solution or the materials are moving through the membrane because of osmosis. The, uh, the nanofiltration is you're pushing solution through the membranes with pressure. And then finally, acid filtration use a, using a product called Profix, which is a combination of precipitation and filtration. So acid absorption, <clears throat> Ecotech is a company I've worked with in the past, uh, helping companies uh, in one case with anodizing solution. And this is the example of anodizing. Um, this is their AnoPure uh, system uh, for removing dissolved aluminum from the anodizing bath. And this is a figure from Ecotech where this is the uh, resin bead uh, you have aluminum sulfate, which is the dissolved aluminum from the anodizing bath, which doesn't get picked up by the sulfuric acid, or by doesn't get picked up by the resin, and then sulfuric acid, which is picked up by the resin. Um, and I, just as a side note, um, Ecotech is now part of Coke Membranes, so it's uh, become part of a much bigger company. I think I missed a slide here. Okay. Um, so anyways, the bottom line is with this particular system is you have um, aluminum sulfate uh, coming through from the top of the column and coming out the bottom. So there's your uh, aluminum sulfate going out as a waste stream that now needs to be treated. Uh, now, once the resin gets saturated with sulfuric acid, then you flush the resin with water. And now you get your sulfuric acid back as a relatively clean sulfuric acid to go back into your anodizing tank. Okay, electrodialysis. Um, this is a fairly new technology and I only found one company, this PC cell uh, from Germany. Uh, the way their schematic is set up here, uh, they've got a pickling bath that also that has this uh, acid electrodialysis, and then their pickling bath rinse tank also has a system set up. Same technology. So what you have going on is you are removing the heavy metals uh, from the 
pickling bath and then you're sending back metal free acid back to the pickling tank. In the case of the rinse tank, now you've got uh, basically water going back into the rinse tank uh, and then the concentrated acid being pulled out of the rinse tank now going back to the pickling bath. Now again, you have waste water coming out of the system which has to go to, through treatment. Uh, diffusion dialysis, again, an interesting process from the standpoint that now it's uh, <clears throat> again a membrane. This membrane allows the hydrogen, nitrate, and fluorine in this case uh, can go through the membrane. The metal ions cannot go through the membrane. So you have your spent acid coming in on this side. It's a counterflow system. Spent acid going in, uh, coming out the other side is the metals that can't make it through the membrane. On this side of the membrane, you've got water going in and now you have uh, the osmosis pulling the hydrogen or the hydrofluoric and the nitric into the water stream. And now you've got your reclaimed acid going out. Now, again, this is a solution coming out that needs to be wastewater treated high in, high in metal ions. This is an example. I've worked with MechChem Associates uh, on several projects. This is an actual unit. Uh, this is the stack of membranes. And this is their schematic to kind of give you a good idea how that works. <clears throat> so you have your water going in. Now it's going in the top. You have your acid tank that needs to get the metals removed and the acid reclaimed going to the bottom. As it comes back throughout, this is the reject going out. And now you have your water going down and pulling the acid out. Now you've got your reclaimed acid going out. So water in, acid out, um, acid in, uh, metal, high metal stream going out. Nanofiltration, and this is nanofiltration for acid recovery. Um, this is relatively new, again, Coke membranes. Um, for many, many years, um, any sort of uh, uh, osmotic membrane was not acid stable. Uh, so now they're, they've come up with acid stable, in this case, nanofiltrate, nanofiltration membranes. This is also stable to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is impressive in itself. So <clears throat> here's your membrane in this diagram. On the left-hand side, you've got your metal ions and your sulfate, hydrogen, uh, yeah, sulfuric acid on the left side. The sulfuric acid is able to be pushed through based on the pore size. The metal ions cannot go through. So on this side, you're generating a metal rich solution on this side, you have an acid rich solution. Again, you have this wastewater that needs to be treated. Um, this is my last one for the acid end of things, and this is the profix. Uh, again, use this many times, uh, working with companies to try to actually improve the life expectancy of an acid tank. Um, this is an interesting chemistry. It's proprietary. Uh, it produces insoluble metal silicates uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual acid tank. Um, it also has an interesting ability to also tie up organic compounds. Uh, and then both the organics and the metallics are able to be filtered. So what's shown here is a tank. And this is a Flow King filter system. It's got the cartridge that actually sits in the tank. So you're filtering within the tank. Um, and then as the, as the precipitate gradually accumulates on that cartridge, the flow will slow down and then you'll have to be changing out the cartridge. Now, I'll point out, uh, if you looked at all these other acid recovery, acid uh, cleanup systems, <clears throat> it's fairly interesting equipment, fairly expensive equipment, in terms of equipment, you've got the filter pump. 
um, and you have no uh, liquid waste. So this is what the profix precipitate on a filter looks like. This happens to be a spiral wound, spiral wound filter. And the green crud is a mixture of organics and the metal silicates. Uh, I've seen the um, spun cartridge type uh, filters where you can actually wipe off the sludge and keep reusing the cartridge for at least a few more cycles. And the fiber uh, spiral wound, maybe not. But the whole point is what you're disposing of in terms of hazardous material is cartridges or sludge that you've wiped off the cartridges. There is no wastewater to be treated. Here's the uh, systems that uh, I've worked with a few of these systems, but here's the systems that are actually listed as having been tried uh, with Profix and been successful. Um, I can, <laughs> of course, I when I was doing a project with uh, Profix, the first project I tried happened to be uh, a system that didn't work with Profix. And so I'm just going to point that out right now. It was a combination of nitric acid and hydrofluoric acid, um, but it was etching titanium. Uh, in all these systems, if you're doing steel, copper, you name it, when you are etching the metal, you're generating cations, so positive ions. In the case of the combination of nitric plus hydrofluoric and titanium, it formed an anion complex. So Profix works on cations, does not work on anions. So that was my, um, my lesson learned for one of the few items that Profix does not work with. <laughs> uh, this is one of the better case studies. This is Albright Electropolishing, Clearwater, Florida. Um, they're a stainless steel electropolishing shop, two tanks, 800 gallons, 900 gallons. Electropolishing takes a lot of metal off of parts. So therefore you are getting a significant amount of metal buildup fairly rapidly and you're consuming acid fairly rapidly. Um, so in 2002, these guys were large quantity generators at 33,000 pounds of hazardous waste purchased $23,000 worth of new acid that year. They were always decanting portions of each tank to remove some of the dissolved metals load and adding, adding back with fresh acid. 2004 data, the first full year they were using Profix, they went down to 11,000 pounds of hazardous waste. So they became a small quantity generator. They only had to purchase $3,000 worth of new acid and they had, to, they had no more tank decanting. So much, much reduced waste as well as reduced acid use, uh, which obviously means there's a lot less treatment going on. Uh, so again, cost savings. Okay, back to alkaline cleaners. The first step in removing or, uh, dirts, oils, greases from parts before you get to the next step. Um, the whole idea of at least what I've, my experience has been, I would say every place I've been to has used alkaline or caustic cleaners in their first bath to take off the oils and greases. Um, so again, cleaning chemistry is lost, drag out to the rinse, reaction with organics, emulsification, chelation, et cetera. And as the cleaner, effectiveness degrades, uh, you have that potential of redeposition of contaminants back on the parts, which then suggests you're going to be doing some rework. So one of the things I've always recommended is make sure you're monitoring your cleaners. And most clean, chemical cleaning suppliers can either provide test kits or have test methods to monitor the cleaning chemistry and to make the proper cleaning chemistry additions so that there's always uh, a way to keep the cleaning reasonably constant, at least in terms of the chemistry. Now, there are ways to get the cleaning chemistries cleaner. And I'll explain.
explain that. <laughs> if you are doing a proper job of taking off your oils, they're probably being emulsified in the cleaning chemistry or they're floating to the surface. Um, one way to get an oil emulsion to break is you cool the bath down and I'll say sometimes, sometimes that allows that emulsion to form an oil layer and get skimmed off. So basically a weekend shutdown to let the tank cool down. Not energy efficient because now you're cooling the tank or allowing the tank to cool and have to heat it up at the beginning of the week. Uh, you can do continuous in-tank filtration um, that can usually remove suspended solids. So you're talking the particulate. Um, now, the bad news is typical polymer filters can't tolerate solution temperatures above roughly 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So a polymer filter has limitations. And I always recommend bullet three to have in-tank spargers and weirs to at least get the surface oil removed. Now, <clears throat> finally, what I came upon oh, quite a few years ago now is a high temperature, high pH tolerant, uh, not sure what to call it, metal ceramic ultra filter. It can remove the colloidal solids, which are floating solids and the emulsified oils. And in most cases, can't say all cases, in most cases retaining much of the cleaning chemistry. So this is what I found and have been recommending. This is a titanium oxide stainless steel matrix micro slash ultra filter. It's somewhere in between microfiltration and ultra filtration in terms of particle size. It's made by a company called Ar ArborTech, which was recently purchased by Hubbard Hall. Um, the, the filter is able to remove solids and oil emulsions and it can go as high as 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which means you can have a hot tank being filtered while you were running your operation. Extremely pH tolerant, one to 14. So uh, caustic solution, no problem. Now this is what they call their Washer Washer Pro Series from ArborTech. Uh, they actually have a separate tank. So you're pumping from your uh, operational tank to this tank, this tank is going through the filtering operation and pushing the cleaning, clean, cleaner back into the operating tank and is concentrating, uh, I'll call it the goo for one of a better description. A case study, uh, this is a, a Midwest engine manufacturer. A lot of these companies don't want to let anybody know who they are, partially because they actually consider this kind of stuff a competitive advantage. But they started with um, a cleaning tank dump frequency of two weeks. So every two weeks dumping their cleaner, which then had to go to wastewater treatment. Now they're up over five weeks uh, between dumps. So they've saved on cleaning chemistry because they're not making up fresh chemistry every two weeks. Now, this is always important for uh, metal finishers you're getting improved part cleaning consistently. So there's less rework. You're not getting oils redeposited on the parts. Uh, so you're, you're getting more consistent, uh, more effective cleaning over time. This is the economics, 2005 cost. So they bought what they call a washer washer. This is the ArborTech unit for almost $40,000. Uh, some stands for the unit. 2000 installation 4000 total of almost $46,000. So this is what the client was able to save that first year. So cleaning purchase reduction or cleaner, excuse me, cleaner the chemistry purchase reduction. Almost 38,000 and now wastewater cost reduction because now you're not treating this caustic 7,000. So $45,000 so return on investment of roughly a year. So that's uh, that's not too shabby for considering that's a one year payback. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Dave. Great. And again, we'll save those comments in the chat box um, till the end. And uh, Greg, if you want to share your screen, I will introduce you. Greg is a research manager for Turi. Greg leads research efforts 
to identify and evaluate solutions to the use of toxic chemicals used in various industries. Greg has led research in the area of hex chrome free coating applications related to the aerospace and defense sectors for the past 10 years. Um, and he will be reporting on that to you now. Greg, are you on mute? Greg, you are on mute. It's like his ghost shared his screen and then walked away. Oh. Um, yeah, so not only has Zoom been glitchy, but um, Heather said that there have been reports of widespread outages across the Comcast system. Yeah, yeah we had a big Comcast outage here this morning. Yep. Are you back with us, Greg? Yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, Great. Right. Thank can you. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Excellent. Let's get going. Um, thank you all um, for the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, what I'll be talking about is the collaborative research that Jury has done with the aerospace defense industry to um, try to evaluate hex chrome free solutions for different coding applications. So the outline of what we'll be talking about, we'll talk about this research process, and then the three coding applications that we'll, we'll talk about are the sealants, bond primers, conversion coatings, and we'll go through the results for each of those evaluations. And we've been at this for about 10 years now. So just to give you an idea of the time frame, uh, we started with the sealants, and that was back in 2012 to 2014. Then once we had great success with that, then we moved to the bond primers and worked on those from 2015 through 2017. And once we got good results with those, then we moved on to conversion coatings in 2018. And we're wrapping that up um, as we speak. So just to give you an idea of a typical coating application stack up and aerospace defense industry. So you've got a substrate and we're primarily dealing with aluminum substrates. <clears throat> and then on top of that, you have a conversion coating. Then if there's any cracks or joints, you would have a sealant and then you would overcoat that with a primer and a top coat. And typically the um, conversion coating sealant primer have hex chrome as a corrosion inhibitor. Um, within them, and we're trying to move to a totally hex chrome free stack up where there is no hex chrome in any of the coating layers. So it's been a collaborative effort to do this research, and uh, we've been working with um, government, and so the Army, Navy, Air Force, and NASA. And for industry, we've been working with a number of the large OEMs in the um, aerospace defense industry, um, including Lockheed, Martin, Boeing, Raytheon. <clears throat> and also we've had a, a new member join a couple of years ago, um, Blue Origin, which you may be familiar with. Um, they're the ones that launched Jeff Bezos into space. Um, so we, we have pretty good representation across the industry. So the first, application we'll talk about is sealants. So we looked at six different sealants and um, we had one as a baseline to do the comparison against that was the uh, PS870. And then we had four alternative sealants that we looked at <clears throat> that had a variety of different types of corrosion inhibitor chemistries. And then we had a negative control, which was a sealant that didn't have any corrosion inhibitor. So we put that in there to make sure our experiments were working correctly, because if the one without corrosion inhibitor worked the best, we knew we had a problem. Um, so those are the six sealants that we included. And we needed a test vehicle to do the uh, evaluation. And so what we have for a test vehicle, it's three aluminum plates that are brought together 
and fastened together with um, six fasteners and six bolts. So by doing this, we create a number of different um, opportunities for evaluating salience. So we create a fang surface, which is when you've got two surfaces that are sandwiched together. Uh, so it's basically the surface in between. Uh, we've got a butt joint area. So when you've got two surfaces that don't quite um, close the gap and there's a gap, we call that a butt joint. So with the sealant, we're going there. And also we have fasteners and we apply sealants over the fasteners to try to prevent um, any uh, penetration to the fastener area. And we did all this with um, 7075 aluminum alloy. And we also used stainless steel bolts and nuts so that we would have um, a mismatch between the metals, which could also create further corrosion issues. So we're trying to do worst case scenario. So just to give you an idea of the actual process and how all the different participants were involved. Um, so to do this evaluation, we put the conversion coating on the panels at uh, Northrop Grumman down in Maryland. Then uh, the, the panels went to Raytheon in Arizona and they did the priming, the painting and the scribing and the assembling of the, the test vehicles. Then, um, Prior to the testing, we did some preconditioning at uh, the US Navy in Maryland, and it was both thermal and mechanical preconditioning. So we would put them in a chamber and we would cycle the temperatures between hot and cold. And at the same time, we would have the test vehicles um, under load um, throughout that thermal cycling. So to really stress the joints and um, stress the sealant um, in between the joints. Then once the test vehicles were preconditioned, then we did uh, some accelerated corrosion testing, uh, which was SO2 salt fog. And that was done at Lockheed Martin in Texas. And um, we also did long-term corrosion testing where they're exposed to an ambient environment. And we did that at the Kennedy Space Center uh, with NASA down in Florida. And we did that for a one year duration. So the results of all that testing. <clears throat> so in the uh, uh, fang surface in the butt joint areas, we had four of the non-hexchrome sealants had comparable corrosion prevention performance to the baseline uh, sealant that did have the hexchrome. So that was great. And for the fastener holes and fastener areas, uh, it's a little more challenging. So, but we did have three of the non-hex chrome products um, that had comparable results to the baseline um, hex chrome product. So overall, we have a number of different options um, that passed um, these corrosion tests and uh, for these companies to switch to. And the details of all this, I, I covered it very quickly, <laughs> but uh, you can get a lot more details um, was in an article that was published in um, Product Finishing and it's available on the Terry website at this URL. And we, we wrote that article with uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin as co-authors. The next application we'll talk about is bond primers. And so you use bond primers when you need to have a structural bond between two metal substrates. And again, we're just talking about aluminum substrates. And <clears throat> so you would have an aluminum substrate, you would do some type of surface preparation on that substrate. Then you would apply the bond primer. And then you would do that on both um, uh, substrates. And then you would apply an adhesive and then put the substrates together to make a bond, a structural bond. For the bond primers, we also we evaluated six bond primers, and we had one baseline that had hex chrome, the BR 127. We had three that had non hex chrome corrosion inhibitors, and we actually had two products that didn't have any corrosion inhibitor. 
So this time we looked at both 7075 and 2024 aluminum alloys. And um, we looked at three different surface preps. Um, first was phosphoric acid anodized PAA. And then we had aluminum oxide grit blast. Then we had grit blast followed by sole gel. So those were the three different surface preparations we looked at. And we looked at two different types of adhesives, one from SciTech and one from 3M. And for the testing, we did two types of testing. We did neutral salt fog for the corrosion testing. And we also did wedge crack extension testing. And for those who are not familiar with the wedge crack extension testing, as you remember, we're trying to evaluate the integrity of the structural bond between the two aluminum substrates. So the wedge crack test, extension test, basically you take a wedge and hammer it into between two bonded um, uh, substrates, and then you measure the initial crack length, and then you measure um, how that crack grows over time and propagates. So the stronger the bond, the less crack growth you will see over time. And the results? For doing this work is first, we found that the PAA surface treatment um, had the best corrosion resistant results and the lowest crack lengths. So that came out as a recommendation to use that as a surface preparation. And then for the bonding strength, we found that we did a nine week test for the average crack length. And we had three alternative non-hexachrome bond primers that actually had better results than the baseline hexachrome BR-127 product. And for the, um, for the um, corrosion testing with the, the salt fog, we found that two of the alternative um, non-hexachrome bond primers had better performance than the bond primer that had the hexachrome, the BR-127. So overall, the results um, show that with a PAA surface treatment, two of the alternative products without hexachrome actually had better performance than the, the baseline for both the corrosion protection and for the bonding strength. And so we wrote this, this up as well in product finishing and wrote the article with uh, Raytheon, uh, Lockheed Martin, Navy, and NASA. And um, it's publicly available and it's available on the Turi website at the UL URL right there. So if you want to see more details about the bond trauma testing, you can look that up. The third application that we looked at is conversion coatings. And this is the one that we're just finishing up now. <clears throat> So we did some preliminary testing to narrow down the actual conversion coating materials that we looked at. And we narrowed it down to these five that we did a more extensive testing on. So we use the uh, Allodyne 1200S as the baseline containing the hexachrome. And then we use four different alternative conversion coatings that did not have hexachrome. And three of them are based on trivalent chromium technologies, and one is a zirconate. So for the test vehicles, we needed to apply the conversion coating. And here we have what standards we adhered to. And for the applicators, for the Chemion EPCP, application and for the Allodyne 1200S baseline, we did that at Polymetal in Springfield, Mass. And for the Sulcoserif TCS packs, we did that at International Hard Coat in Michigan. And the reason we did it there is that's the only location, it's a new product and it's the only metal finishing uh, shop in the country that had a line up and running and with experience with that. Um, technology. And then for the PPG products, uh, the Deso Prep 4000 and the TCP product, we did that at uh, PPG in Pennsylvania. 
And this time we had a little more comprehensive um, alloy assortment. We had 6061, 7075, 2024, and 2219. So they kind of go in from left to right in increasing amount of copper content. So the more copper there is in the aluminum alloy, the more difficult it is to um, get the corrosion protection that you need. So by including the 2219, we were really uh, pushing the limits uh, for corrosion protection. Then the primer and top coat. So we used a PPG product that was actually not even qualified yet for the mill standards, but the members of the consortium had done a lot of internal testing on that primer, and they felt that it was the best one on the market, even though it wasn't qualified that it would be um, soon. So we, we, we used that. And for the non-hexchrome top coat, we used another PPG product that was qualified. And we applied those, the primer and the top coat at um, CIL and, and Lawrence. So for the testing, we did a number of tests for the conversion coating. We did paint adhesion to make sure that the paint would stay on the surface. We did electrical contact resistance testing. We did neutral salt fog on bare aluminum. Then we did neutral salt fog on painted panels. Then we did SO2 salt fog. And we also did beachfront ambient long-term testing down at Kennedy Space Center at NASA again. And that beachfront testing was started in December of last year. So it's been going for 11 months. So we have 11 months worth of uh, results. And the, the plan is to do it for a minimum of one year. So in December of next, this December, we'll look at the results and decide will we want to continue it or not based on the results. Uh, this shows the test vehicle that we use for the conversion coatings, just a simple test panels, um, two different sizes, one three by 10, one three by six, and it was scribed. And this just shows an example of uh, test panels after we did some SO2 salt fog corrosion testing on the DESO prep uh, conversion coating on the 2219 alloy. So you can see after 336 hours, we've got, uh, a lot of propagation of corrosion outside of the scribe area. So this just shows the progression uh, and the propagation of that corrosion over time. For the results of the testing, overall, across all different four aluminum alloys that we use, the Sokoserif product was the best performing hex chrome free. And specifically for the more challenging alloys with the higher copper content, uh, the 2024 Asako Surf uh, passed the coating weight, the paint adhesion, the NSF uh, bare aluminum, uh, the SO2 test, and, and beachfront corrosion test. So it passed a number of the tests. Uh, so that was great results. And for the 2219, once again, Soko Surf was the best. Um, it passed several, but not as many test would pass as the 2024 alloy, because again, the 2219 is much more challenging with the high copper content. So basically, in our paper, we wrote, no single evaluation will completely resolve the longstanding issue of replacing hex chrome and conversion coatings. However, the results of this evaluation provide significant progress to achieving that goal, since numerous hex chrome free conversion coatings pass several of the qualification tests for various alloys. And we've written up the results for this with uh, Raytheon and uh, Lockheed Martin. And we have submitted it to the Journal of Aerospace Technology and Management. And it's currently under peer review and we're getting um, comments from the peer reviewers as we speak. So hopefully we'll get through that process in the next month or so. And then we can post uh, this article um, on our website because we're going to make it uh, publicly available and uh, free access. So hopefully we'll be able to share that in about a month from now. And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, okay, at this point, um, Pam is going to 
uh, post a quick poll to make sure everybody's awake. Um, it's just, it refers back to um, the checklist that Miguel mentioned. Um, this is part of it we pulled out with, uh, that's relevant to input substitution and Pam will later post uh, the link to the full or the PDF for the full um, checklist as well for you guys to take a look at. But first go ahead and submit this um, uh, poll question, please. Got about half of you completing this so far. Let's see if we can't get a few more in here and then we can see what the results are. And I like when we're doing polls, I like to ask our uh, speakers what their thoughts are on the results. So let's just give it one more quick second, get your response in there. And I will end the poll and share the results. So Miguel and Dave, what do you think? Input substitution options that have been implemented, does this look familiar? Uh, yes, it does look familiar. Um, in the city of Los Angeles, a lot of uh, facilities are doing um, alkaline degreasing. Uh, we have a big number of facilities doing that already and also using water-based cleaners. Mm -hmm. Great, cool. So not a lot of um, use of non-chelator chemicals. Yes. Um, yep. So this seems to be in line with what you've seen in, in LA. That's Yes, cool. yes. It is about the same profile of, uh, of how facilities are operating, I guess, across. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Let yeah. me stop sharing this one then, and I'm going to run the second poll. Um, and this is about reuse and recovery. So check all of the following waste reduction techniques designed to reduce the amount of toxics used or hazardous byproducts generated at your facility or at your client's facilities. So if you could go ahead and respond, check as many as apply. We've got about 50% of you responding. Let's give it a little bit more time and see what we have. And again, it'll be interesting to see if the profile that we find here in Massachusetts um, matches what Miguel has seen in LA. Why don't I go ahead and end the poll and I'll share the results. So Miguel, what do you think? Look familiar? Um Yes, it looks familiar. Uh, just, um, yeah, I think the uh, alternate treatment system, electrochemical is not so heavy in LA either. Many of uh, facilities are relying on manual or not even, uh, uh, yes, manual treatment of, of waste streams. And um, waste stream segregation, yes, we are implementing and promoting waste segregation. Uh, drug out reduction, not so much. And uh, this is a chain for some metal finishers since a lot of precious uh, chemicals using in electroplating uh, bath are lost due to drag out. So, um, but I see more in uh, here in Massachusetts. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Yes. Cool. All right, I'll stop sharing then. Go ahead. So Ray. I guess Turi is doing uh, their work. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Miguel, for your input there. Um, yep, so I'm going to go back to the chat box. Um, if our speakers want to turn on their camera so we can um, direct questions to you back from when Miguel was presenting a question on sandblasting, sandblasting versus the use of acids for cleaning seems to be very expensive alternative. Is that what you have found in LA? Uh, well, this I think is, is right. Um, uh, sun blasting could be expensive, but that's exactly the finding. We don't promote one way or another one. It's, it's just exactly what the data shows. 
Well, well and I would say in my experience with companies around New York State, uh, it would be an unusual situation where they would do sandblasting, uh, like a very rusty, rusty parts or yes. things where you're not terribly concerned with uh, dimensions. So, you know, companies where they're making uh, gears or something like that, no, they're not going to sandblast. They're going to they're going to be doing some sort of other chemical cleaning method as just yes. to avoid damaging the parts. Pickling and all that, yeah. Um, another question here, uh, is nickel plating being substituted for lead plating in LA? Uh, no, uh, what I said is uh, lead, it is especially in um, printed circuit board manufacturing, lead is being substituted by, by by tin only, and and that is a, the the factor driving that change is again uh, the uh, restriction of hazardous substances, the European legislation. Okay, this question came from um, when uh, Dave, you were presenting on the nano filter, I believe. Is there a volume recovery threshold size that makes this economically feasible? Oh, for nano filter? Yeah. Uh, it nano or uh, not nano filter you're talking actually sorry let me back up are you talking uh, nano uh, membranes or nano i'll ask more tomorrow you want to provide further clarification on your question yeah i'm sorry i wanted it for the um the uh the filter membrane the filter the membrane yeah not the nano one the one before that oh i'm sorry okay yeah. so you're so you're talking the um, uh, diffusion dialysis. The, oh, the diffusion dialysis. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, diffusion dialysis is um, usually it, it's it's got a fairly good yield uh, in terms of recovery. It's just a case of you know, can it can it keep up with the process? So you have to be sizing your uh, the system based on the size of your tank and how much you know works going through the tank. So it's not an easy answer. Okay, this one is related to the nano. What is the nano membrane made of? Do you know? Oh, oh, you're talking about the actual nano. Um, I, um, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm. I suspect from it's Jim, proprietary. Jim at OTA, Jim at OTA you, you're going to need to go do your research there on that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, another question is, do you have cost-saving examples for acid reduction projects? More again, um, if you want to expand on yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I had the one slide that was talking about, uh, it was Albright. I'm trying to bring it up now. Uh, Albright was saving a de decent amount of money in terms of acid uh, purchases. Uh, that was their big savings. Now, one thing I didn't mention and it didn't show up in that slide is um, the actual cost of the profix. Mm. I'll just mention that really briefly. Uh, it's a it's a one percent addition to the tank. So if you got a hundred gallon tank, it's one percent of a hundred gallons which is one gallon. Uh, the last time I checked, the profix was $70 per gallon. So there's an initial cost of um, adding profix to a, a, an existing acid tank. Now, after that initial addition, it's 1% profix added for the amount of fresh acid added. So let's say you add uh three gallons of fresh acid every week uh it's one percent of three gallons so one percent profix for three gallons so you're adding very small quantities of profix after that initial fairly hefty dosing so it's it's a fairly i, I would call it a semi-expensive chemical but it's not it doesn't require large quantities Okay. Um, what's the gallon per minute capacity of the Arbor Tech in the case study you provided? Oh, um, it depends on their unit. That particular unit, I 
don't recall the numbers for, you know, how many, how many gallons per hour. Do you, do you know how quickly the flux declined? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it really depends on the loading. Yeah. Um, so if it's light, light oils, greases uh, showing up in your parts coming, going in, yeah, the decline will be days. Yeah. If, <laughs> if they're really dirty parts or really oily parts, uh, it could be every day that the, the, you start to see a decline. Uh, this question goes back to Miguel. Um, how are they able to get around tin whiskers when substituting tin for lead? Uh, yes, uh, that is kind of like a very specific uh, question. Uh, one of the um, facilities that is trying to move on to tin only plating has not yet um, processed parts for its clients. So I cannot answer that specific question, but I will. I would love to follow up and, and see what um, once they they are uh, they are approved by their clients. I will. I will dig more and hopefully I can report back to to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have two minutes left, and I just want to um, I want to ask a quick question of of all the speakers as to what do you think is the the greatest um, incentive for companies to do any of these pollution prevention projects? Hmm. I would say, I would say, at least for the cleaning end of uh, this kind of stuff, is you're, you're getting more consistent uh, parts cleaning. Uh, that in its, I mean, you know, platers, platers, for instance, are always trying to make sure whatever it is they do works and have more consistent cleaning tanks and acid etch tanks in terms of process control i'd say that in itself is worth the rework mm -hmm. so performance performance yes the performance miguel thoughts on that uh yes I, you know for us in city of los angeles we have a very interesting um case uh, a good percentage of uh, uh, facility owners were former employees of big corporations. And some of them, they decided to copy the dynamics of metal finishing and they lack the science behind metal finishing. And so it is more informational on, for example, drag out. It, it, drag out reduction is heavy in Massachusetts and that has to do with the level of uh, knowledge in the entire process. So bringing drag out, even though it is a simple uh, pollution prevention practice, it requires a, a good understanding of what is the science and, and what, how is the layout of, of, the, of the rinsing system in order to maximize uh, savings because drag out is a, is a big source of losses. So it is more educational. And, and, and that's, I, I, I like what, what you did over here on your, on this post, because this gave me uh, ideas on which, which way we, we, we need to go. Great. I, I admire and I, I commend uh, Massachusetts for 69% on drag out reduction. Mm -hmm. It's great. Greg, any thoughts? Um, I mean, you know, the speakers talked about performance, but I would say just the improvement for employee health and safety for adopting some of these green chemistry solutions, I think is a, a huge driver for an incentive to moving on some of these opportunities. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. So it's 431. So we're at our, our time limit. And um, like I mentioned before, the uh, checklist that LA is developing. Um, it's in draft form, but it's um, Pam. It's going to be shared on the uh, conference materials along with the presentations that you can find on our website um, later. So um, I'm all set, Pam. If you want to say any conclusions. 
You're muted. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. You did a great job. Very interesting and a really good way to end the conference. Um, hopefully, I'll get to see many of you in person next spring. Um, please don't forget to reach out to OTA and Turi if you have any questions about reporting or planning. And um, have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.